the challenge of the Yukon. On, King! On, you husky! The wonder dog, King, swiftest and strongest of Eskimo lead dogs, blazes the trail through storm and snow for Sergeant Preston as he meets the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was typical of the small band of Northwest Mounted Police who preserved law and order in the new Northwest country, where the greed for wealth and power led to frequent violence and bloodshed. But in spite of the odds against them, Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, King, met that challenge, and justice ruled triumphant. <laughs> The Wheel of Fortune Saloon in Cypress City was the most elaborate gambling place in the Yukon. Where most of the saloons and cafes were hurriedly thrown together barns, the Wheel of Fortune was different. It was different because Duke Mendoza, the small, elegantly dressed gambler who owned half of it, brought to the last and greatest North American frontier some of the lavishness that had made San Francisco's gambling halls famous. There was a luxury about the solid mahogany bar and the drapes hanging in the long room that pleased Mendoza. He smiled to himself as he toyed with his watch chain, the diamond on his well-cared-for hands glittering in the light. With his partner, he stood watching the installation of a new roulette wheel. <laughs> when the miners get a look at this tonight, they'll be throwing their gold at us, Sam. I still think you shouldn't have bought it. We laid out too much cash for a duke. Don't forget, we're in business to make money. What's wrong with you? Haven't you been getting more out of it than you ever put into the place? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm not kicking about that, but... This wheel isn't an ordinary one. What do you mean? We'll make a thousand times out of it what we put out to buy it. Well, maybe we didn't need it. We're getting along. But anyone can do that up here. These miners that spend all their time working their diggings, get so hard up for diversion, they begin talking to themselves. When they get to town, the first place they head for is a saloon. <laughs> oh, I ain't complaining that business is bad. A lot more dust passes through our hands than we'd ever see if we was to spend our time digging for it like the suckers that throw it away in here every night. That's just what I mean. And that's why I want to make the Wheel of Fortune the natural spot for them to head for when they come in. <laughs> eh, the place has got class, Sam. You don't see men fighting to get into the golden nugget, do you? <laughs> no. We do three times the business McLaughlin does in that saloon of his. And I'll give the devil his due, Duke. You're the one that's responsible for it. So, give me credit for having a reason to make an investment like this. Investment? I don't get you. I'll show you what I mean. All right, boys, that's fine. Just leave it like that. Yeah, it sure looks interesting, Duke. Well, then come in tonight and play it, Charlie. It's an easy way to double your money. Yeah, well, might at that. Well, see you later. Sure, sure. Here you are, Sam. See this gadget under here? Uh-uh. I should have known you wouldn't get a straight piece of merchandise. Oh, then you know how this works, huh? Sure. I seen one like that in Frisco when I worked at the Double Eagle. The magnet does the trick. And a twist of the wrist under the table takes care of the rest. Like I said, this thing will pay for itself a thousand times over. <laughs> uh, I should have known better to argue with you in the first place, I guess. Yeah, I know how this game gets you. It looks like an easy one to beat. That's the beauty of it, Sam. We should have had a roulette wheel a long time ago. It's the first one in the Yukon. And by the time other places get around to installing them, the novelty will have worn off. <laughs> we'll have a crowded house tonight, and I guarantee we'll net more dust than we ever have before. Meantime, at a small cabin several miles north of Cypress City, Sergeant Preston sat talking to Matt and Paul Wilson. The Mountie smiled to himself as he thought of the difference in the temperaments of the two brothers, both of whom he'd known since their arrival in the Yukon several months earlier. 
Well, I've never claimed to have any psychic powers, but I think you two will hit pay dirt here. I don't think it's so, Jill. I know. We've already uncovered enough gold to prove we were right, but we'll be hitting the real thing any time now. Now, I wish you all the luck in the world. <clears throat> What's your hurry? You don't have to hit the trail right away, do you? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Have to be in Cypress City today, and I'd like to get an early start. I have to go in for some supplies. How about waiting a few minutes, and I'll make the trip with you. It isn't often that I can have company on my way in. Yeah, that'd be fine. Good. I'll be with you in a few minutes. I'll bring in some of that wood before I leave, Paul, and you won't have to bother with it while I'm gone. Suits me. Be right back, Sergeant. You know, Matt's the best brother anyone could have, Sergeant. Well, then why the frown? You say that as if you were worried about him. Worried? Well, I guess I was thinking about what'll happen as soon as he gets into town. Oh, what's that? I'm not a gambling man myself, but I'd lay you two to one. He'll be playing poker in some saloon not 15 minutes after he gets in. Kelly likes to talk to other prospectors and seems the best place to find them is around poker tables. No, that's not it. He's got this thing in his blood, and you can't talk him out of it. Every time he goes into a poker game, he expects to come out with his money tripled. The fact that he doesn't, he chalks up to luck. But I suppose he enjoys it. Only I sure hope he doesn't throw his shirt in one of these days. Here you are, Paul. Ah, thanks. Now, if you're ready, Sergeant, let's get started. <laughs> right. Looks like King's kind of anxious to get back on the trail again. He always resents being indoors, unless there's something around to arouse his curiosity. Yeah, I guess he puts up with the warmth of the cabin just to be near you. Now, stop in again the next time you get up this way. I will, Paul. And thanks for putting us up for the night. I'll mention it. While you're in town, I'll keep working at the mine, Matt. Who knows? Maybe I'll strike it. <laughs> Boy, if you do, you sure better burn the wind getting into town to tell me about it. We must sound like a couple of kids to you, Sergeant, with a special Christmas package we want to open together. Well, that's the way we feel about the mine. Everything we've done on it, we've done together. And when we strike, it's going to be big. <laughs> In Cypress City, several hours later, Sergeant Preston covered his duties with the great dog King walking close at his heels. As the Mountie went about the settlement, no detail was too small to escape his notice. He walked with the slow, deliberate stride of a man who'd spent long periods of time on the trail. The snow crunched noisily beneath his boots. And as he turned toward the Wheel of Fortune saloon, he saw Matt Wilson going through the door ahead of him. Neither Matt nor the policeman had any way of knowing that even then, at the small cabin north of the city, Paul stood staring almost unbelievingly at the gold he held in his hand. Oh, I've struck it. I've struck the vein. Oh, I never thought I would when I told Matt. Oh, oh wheedly is this. Burn the wind, he said. That's what I'm doing right now. And believe me, brother, we'll celebrate. Sergeant Preston stood near the door of the Wheel of Fortune, his eyes on the men circling the roulette table, all of them staking fabulous amounts of precious dust on the small ivory ball spinning dizzily along the red and black numbers. There was a recklessness in the air, a recklessness that had already cleaned many a prospector's pocket of the dust he'd carried with him into the saloon. The policeman noticed the look of intense concentration on Matt Wilson's face as he leaned forward to place his chips. Sergeant Preston walked toward the table, great dog King silently following his master. Number 16 it is, red. All right, gentlemen, place your bets, place your bets. How's your luck, Matt? There, there it is on number four. Huh? Oh, 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 it's you, Sergeant. Well, my luck hasn't been so good this far. Well, I'll say it hasn't. That boy's lost just about every time he put the chip down. But for that matter, so did the rest of us. The house is making money, hmm? Oh, it's paid off a couple of times. Ready? Oh, hey, look! Black number five. That's where I had my chips, Duke. Looks like you pay me. All right, Cole. Anyone have a chip on the line? No. Uh, too bad. Yeah, I should have put it on the line. What's wrong, son? You're running out of dust. Almost. Here goes the last of it. So far, I've just missed by one number every time. 
Preston stood not far from Duke Mendoza. And as King looked about him, he moved restlessly, seeking to get away from the heavy boots he had to constantly dodge. The man standing next to Mendoza shifted his position, and quickly King slipped under the table. The dog settled himself on the floor, prepared to wait until his master was ready to leave the crowded saloon. Duke, I'm fresh out of dust, but I've got half interest in one of the richest states in this part of the country. I'll lay my interest on number eight. Hey, now, wait a minute, kid. That's taking a pretty big chance. My luck will change and I'll risk it. What about it, Duke? If I lose, you get half interest in the mine. If I win, you pay off 36 to 1. Ah, 36 to 1 on what amount? Let's say I've got $1,000 there. If I win, you pay me 36000 It's your gamble. All right. All right. From his vantage point on the floor, King saw the man's hand suddenly appear beneath the edge of the table. Like some disembodied, independent thing, it moved to where a long, slender stick lay on a narrow shelf. Curiously, King raised his head and watched the hand. As it moved, he moved, his nose touching it. Startled, Mendoza shoved King aside, his hand dropping the stick before contacting the magnet controlling the wheel. Hey, what's down there? Down where? Under the table, you fool. I tell you when I stop. What's like you pay off, Duke? There's the ball on number eight. You can pay me 36 to one. As Matt Wilson spoke, Duke Mendoza automatically raised his head. But the sentence he had uttered aroused the interest of the men around the table, and they stopped to discover the reason for his exclamation. Looking under the table, Sergeant Preston saw King lying close to Mendoza's feet with the stick clenched beneath his teeth. King, come here, boy. Let's see what you've got there. Uh, leave him alone, Sergeant. He, uh, <coughs> he meant no harm, I'm sure. But King, trained to instant obedience, was already out from beneath the table, his eyes searching Preston's face to discover whether in seizing the stick he had done something for which he'd be reprimanded. A stick, huh? Hey, what's that... I what does that mean? Like... Some mistake, Sergeant. Now let's just forget it and go on with the play. Oh, no. No, I don't think there has been a mistake, Mendoza. I've been watching the play here for quite a while. And so far, the house has paid out only small sums. I think I begin to understand why. What do you mean, Sergeant? Mendoza, I want to look at this table. Step back, men. Uh -huh. Just as I thought. His wheel is magnetized. Magnetized? You mean it's crooked? Yes. The stick king found under the table was used to manipulate the lodestone here. You see it? So the Mendoza could move it to any position and stop the wheel. Why, you dirty double-crossing sneak. I don't mind losing my money, but I sure as Jupiter don't aim to be cheated out of it. What's going on here, Matt? Paul. Well, I guess Sergeant Preston here just saved me from losing my half of the interest in the mine. In the mine? Yeah, I just laid it on the wheel here. It must have been an accident, Mendoza, but that ball stopped at number eight. You owe Matt $36,000. Well, I, uh... Well, I... I guess I'll pay off. You bet your life you do. Uh, it's a darn good thing for you it came off this way, Matt. Because the reason I came in was to tell you I struck oh, it. What? Yeah. Oh. And to think mm -hmm. I... Maybe this will prove to you that Mr. P.T. Barnum knew what he was talking about. You had a narrow escape, Matt. And as for you, Mendoza, if I come through town again and find your games crooked... You might as well get set to do a jail sentence. Then, after what these men have seen tonight, maybe they'll be more careful where they spend their money. <laughs> the great dog king looked at Preston. What the talk was about, he didn't understand. But as his master's eyes met his, he knew that in some strange way he'd pleased the man he loved with such blind devotion. This knowledge was enough for King, the wonder dog of the Yukon. <laughs> yes, fella? Thanks to you, everything's all right. These copyrighted dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit. And all characters, names, places, and incidents are fictitious. They are sent to you each week at this same time. Bob Height speaking. This is the Michigan Radio Network.